welcome to another edition of the Energy Week Podcast. Ryan Ray alongside Dr. Energy herself, the one and only Ellen Wald. Ellen, how's it going? It's going just fine. I think we were just talking about possibly renaming the podcast Trump Tweets Oil. <laughs> Discuss. <laughs> <laughs> we would have to do it more than once a week. That would be the problem. <laughs> that would be the problem, exactly. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure that we... Uh, um, that uh, uh, we we'd have enough to talk about if we just talked about his oil tweets. Although you never know. Well, if you follow the thread of the tweets that that are inspired by his tweets, you probably could put together enough of the oil tweets. But yeah, it's um, we're gonna get there in a second. Um, let's see here. I know we have on Dr. Foreman today. Um, I saw you have been out and about as always talking various plots. So anything that you're that you made an appearance on that you want to go ahead and talk about before we get to the show yeah uh sure so i was on a trt world which is actually a turkish uh television show but it's uh english language um on their money talks and uh we were talking about saudi arabia's quasi bombshell where uh halat al-fali just announced that oh by the way we might be cutting our oil exports 500,000 barrels per day in december and he'd like the rest of opec to get on board and cut you know, themselves all together cut 500,000 barrels per day for a total cut of a million barrels of oil per day. Uh, You know, personally, I think he's, uh, he's not necessarily saying this is what they're going to do. He's sending out, he's sending out the feelers to see what the response might be. And the oil market seems to have responded for the first time in like weeks, oil went up a little bit. And then of course we had the Trump tweet. (laughs) <laughs> the Trump tweet. Now, yes, we we got to give Trump props. You know, we, we've we begged him to work around our show timing, and he's been listening. He knows we record on Mondays now, so he sent this tweet on a Monday. So thank you, President Trump, at least for giving us the content. Um, this was about forty five minutes before we started recording. Uh, President Trump sent out. Hopefully, Saudi Arabia and OPEC will not be cutting oil production. Oil prices should be much lower based on supply. So let's let's not deal with the the price and how it's connected to the supply and, and all that right now. I, I I don't understand the packaging of this message right now, Ellen. To me, uh, I said a few months ago, if it was me, um, if I was President Trump and the prices were rising, I would blame that on Iran and we had to put sanctions and I would have handled that differently. Um, I also would have talked about how good it was for U.S. shell producers, um, how it's creating jobs. He, it feels like this this oil price issue. He's really separated it and made it really about the Saudis and OPEC, and really takes away from what happens with the U.S. show producers. Um, the price is going much lower, whatever that means. Much is a relative term. Would not be a good thing for a lot of his constituents. Well, exactly. Plus, plus we've got we've got um, the Fed keeps raising interest rates, I mean, incrementally so, but still they keep raising interest rates. And if if interest rates continue to rise, then I think that's going to, a lot of investors at some point are going to say, look, why are we putting our money into these uh, oil companies when we could be investing in bonds or whatever else? And um, so like the, the combination of Trump, like not promoting America's oil industry plus this financial policy is just not really I would say what you want to see. I mean, wouldn't it be better? I mean, if 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 interest rates don't continue to rise and, and perhaps they won't, perhaps they'll kind of slow down the slow rising of interest rates and that will signal to investors, hey, look, put put your money into into stuff, uh, you know, into more lucrative, potentially lucrative deals, then, you know, I, I would I could see that that would uh you know, that would kind of help out the, the shale oil industry. But, like, do you really want to be doing both at the same time? You want to kick them while they're down? Right. And why do you think – I mean, it's kind of hard to get in Trump's mind here. But why do you think he has separated this message? Um, you know, he, he his energy policy was very much um, about the U.S. shale producers, about American energy. Um, but, but now as, as we're – Pre midterms, post midterms, it seems to have no impact on yeah. on his messaging about oil prices. He seemed to really separate that from the U.S. Uh, a portion of that, and, and really made it about a foreign. Is it a foreign affairs issue in his mind, or any any insight that you might have on why he's separating these issues? Well, I think that OPEC is always like a good enemy. You know, OPEC is like the perfect villain 
in any situation because you can decry them for being a monopoly, even if they technically probably aren't really a monopoly, but you can, you know, slap that label on them and say they're anti uh, whatever and they're, they're a monopoly. And so you can hate them for that. And you can hate them because they're full of countries with despotic rulers and, you know, they're anti-competitive and, and whatnot. So it's always like a good enemy to say, and it's better than saying, bad Exxon, bad Chevron, right? Better to blame some foreign country than it is to blame your own oil companies or your own big oil companies. So I, I see it more as a reaction to um, to like a report maybe that was on that says that they're thinking of doing this. Um, and uh, I do think that, that he was very concerned about oil getting to $100 a barrel. And it seemed like, um, well, I don't know if Khalid al was actually concerned about it, but he basically took credit uh, in, in that uh, same uh, speech where he talked about, um, you know, potentially cutting uh, oil exports. He basically said, like, we together staved off oil prices from heading up to 100. And, you know, now we have to make sure that they don't, you know, the, you know, go too low or, or become oversupplied. So he was basically justifying it and taking credit for it. So, um, you know, I don't think that he that they took, that did it alone. I think American production was also very, very important to that, uh, you know, to that whole thing. But um, I, I mean, I think that's a kind of tweet that like is always he sees in his mind a safe bet, like <laughs> big bad Saudis. He has like a like a like a Rolodex of safe tweets to send yeah. out. <laughs> He's like, um, I haven't sent this one out in a week yeah. or two. Let's go ahead. I haven't bashed, <laughs> haven't, haven't bashed OPEC recently. <laughs> that that wouldn't surprise me. Okay, so we are what is it about forty five days, roughly forty eight days, something like that, to the end of the year. And we, we read a lot of reports about oil will hit $100 a barrel. If this, then that, you know, yeah. uh, possibly that. Will we, The question is, will we actually see any more of those articles <laughs> <laughs> come out between now and the end of the year talking about oil could hit $100 a barrel in 2018? I'm going to go on the safe side and say absolutely yes. We will <laughs> definitely see at least one article saying – Oil could hit $100 a barrel by the end of 2018 if aliens come and destroy all of our oil supplies. <laughs> or now, I, I think we definitely now that OPEC is now that the you know they're trying out this potential cut now that they're discussing it. I think that you could definitely see um, talk about that. Besides, like nothing makes an OPEC meeting exciting more than the thought that they could cut so much that we could end up at $100 a barrel. Right. So. Yeah. I, I don't we're... think we'll end up there, right. but we'll definitely see articles talking about it. Okay, so I, we're going to talk about the OPEC articles uh, in just a second we have, but but you um, theorized a few weeks ago that you felt like there was a little bit of um, um, uh, spare capacity in the price, if you will, that the price was a little bit inflated, that it might come back down to, uh, I think you said like $5. Um, we've seen kind of a drop in oil. WTI right now is at 60 Brent's at 70 do you feel like that kind of excess, uh, that inflated price has kind of come back down to where it should be now? I do think that it has. I'm not um, necessarily of the Donald Trump mind where it should actually be lower. Um, I think that the price right now probably also, you know, maybe it doesn't reflect the total amount of supply and demand on the market, but but you've got to take into account the fact that not all oil is created equal and we have uh, a massive surplus of light oil and a not massive surplus of other kinds of oil. And, um, you know, like Canadian oil is seriously bottlenecked. And so I think that the prices are probably a good a, a good reflection of where we are now. Uh, and I do think it had to come down. And I don't think that OPEC should really be that worried about it. I think they are worried about oversupply. It does seem to me that a lot of their oversupply concerns are based on the fact that they seem to think that global demand is really going to be an issue in 2019. And I almost wonder if they maybe shouldn't, and OPEC, if you're listening you might want to consider this. Uh, they maybe shouldn't take the the um, tone of, yeah, we think there might be a global economic slowdown. Um, we see there could be some issues with demand. Instead of pulling back, why don't we flood the market more and hope that low oil prices could kind of kickstart uh, some economic growth? 
Yeah, that's interesting. And, and if they flooded, this this kind of worked it out here. If they flooded the um, the market and dropped the price more, wouldn't that help them long term in the sense of it could put um, U.S. shell producers in financial? You know, we, we talk about the shell producers and how healthy they are, and there's a big debate about that. But the reality is, even um, there's there's plenty of shell producers who are still trying to kind of get that GPA up, if you will. They they're trying to you know come out of the downturn. They've had a good year this year. But um, you know, going through what we went through, you know, two, three, four years ago, it takes a while to kind of rebalance some books. It, would they look at it from that standpoint? And say, you know what, we probably could put a little bit of pressure on some of these U.S. shell production companies by flooding the market, lowering the price. I would imagine if the price hit, you know, it really got really low, forty, thirty, twenty, kind of crazy numbers like that. You would see a lot of companies. <laughs> You know, put their stuff up for sale pretty quick because they just don't have the yeah. the ability to survive that like they did last time. And you know, if I was if I was Khalid Al Fali, this is what I would do. Instead of trying to take my brand new fancy relationship with the Russians out for a spin and you know put put some pressure on it and see what it can do, I would say, look, we're around a hundred percent compliance. This is what we want to stay at. We're just we're going to keep keep it as is um you know we're not going to increase production we're not going to cut production we're going to stay the course uh you know this is this is what our production is going to be that way he's not putting any pressure on the relationship he's got with novak by pressuring them to cut uh and um and you know they're they're staying the course they're not flooding the market but they're not um you know they're they're not um they're not tightening the supply and then uh, go with that for the next six months to, you know, the June or May OPEC meeting, whenever they decide and see where the market is there, because that way you're not like putting extra pressure on shale companies who can essentially let them put pressure on themselves because mm -hmm. the U.S. market is producing so much. And then, um, you know, and also but, but see what, what happens with the interest rates. And if there's just more oil out there, then you put it in storage. Saudis can send it to their petrochemical plants, or they can try to offer better deals to China. Yeah, and I think the other thing is, if I was, um, you know, in OPEC or Saudi Aramco, I would have to look at the price of, you know, the cost of doing business in the Permian. And right now, as we talked about a lot, is that you have you know, minimal pipeline capacity. It's it's pretty much pegged out. Uh, but as you get this time next year, you're going to have a lot of spare pipeline capacity, which means that the cost to transport your oil will go down dramatically because companies are going to be saying, hey, you know, we need oil in our pipelines. Mm -hmm. We're going to have, I think, two million excess barrels uh, capacity in the Permian. So you know, if you're a production company and you're sitting there looking at the second half of 2019, you're looking at it going, okay, we can probably transport our oil for a significant discount, uh, uh, which is a good thing in this case, not, not, not being discounted discounted but you can get it for cheaper um so you can incentivize drilling that way so I, I don't know how much they're factoring that in or if it's not really a big concern for them yeah i i just wonder if they're keep if they're too focused on these um global economic forecasts and uh you know i do I, i'm not surprised that they're floating this idea and that they're talking about it because they should be discussing it if they really do want to say that they're the group that manages global oil supply they've got to be talking about it but i i would i would say like I just don't think that now is the time when you want to press Russia to actually make cuts. Um, they could do symbolic cuts, like they could say, we're all going to cut 0.1% or 1%, which is basically nothing. But they can, you know, say they had a win or they say, could say we, you know, made all, all made a decision together. But I really don't think you want to pressure that Saudi-Russian relationship right now. Uh, it's always easier, like, I mean, they'll find that it was much easier to agree to increase production like they did back in June than it is to decide to cut production. So let's talk about Russia for a second. You, you sent an article in from Reuters, and Novak says that he believes, this is a paraphrase, but essentially that it's more of a seasonal oversupply than, than a serious long-term oversupply. W when you hear that, you go, okay, um, it's not like uh, Novak and the, and the Saudis or OPEC, you know, it's not that they can't share information. They can't, you know, show, swap Excel files or anything. Um, 
What makes it where you know when you read these headlines as someone who studies these foreign markets like you do, do you, are you are you reading these these more as posturing as you were talking about a minute ago with floating out these ideas, or do you think when Novak comes out and says, "Hey, you know this is our data, we really believe it," and then OPEC comes out and says, "This is our data, we really believe it," have they not been able to share data, or are they sharing data and is this they really come to different conclusions, or how do you parse that out? Yeah, one of the things that I always look at when I look at this is, is I say, okay, well, he's speaking to, you know, reporters and to traders and so on. But Novak is also speaking to his own people, namely Russian oil producers. And so, you know, not everyone has to, Al Fali doesn't have to do that. Okay. Aramco and he are like, you know, buddy, buddy, they're, they're going to do the same thing. He doesn't have to convince Aramco of anything. Right. Uh, you know, essentially Aramco runs that, that oil ministry anyway. But when it comes to a country like um, Iran or a country like um, Russia, they also have a population or what whatnot that they need to talk to. And so I would see that as, as he, he's saying to his people, his oil producers, well, you know, I'm not all in on this, this, um, you know, cut business, like we're going to talk about it. And we're going to discuss and he's like, he's saying, I don't think there's going to be serious oversupply. And and he should say something different from OPEC, because even if he is buddy, buddy with Khaled al-Fali, he's also got to show his independence. And that's always a big thing in Russia, he's got to show that he's got his own opinion, and he can stand up for it. And even if in the end, he goes along with what they say, he's got to, at least for a while, stand up for himself and show that he is an independent strong leader for Russia. So that's, essentially that's my reading. No 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 so uh, that's good. So essentially it could be that even even if he did somewhat agree or was more sympathetic to the opposing view um it's a lot of positioning here and outwardly kind of setting up his own independent view um yeah. just for the sake of strong Russian leadership. Right. And that's important for him, not just like to keep his position, but also because that's what they want to see. They don't want to see the worst possible thing would it would be for him to look like he's just bowing to OPEC and doing whatever they want. It's got to be, you know, OPEC and Russia. It can't just be OPEC and Russia's below that or can't just be the Saudis tell everyone what to do. So even if in the end they agree to what Al-Fali wants or some sort of compromise for that, he's he stood up and he said, like, I don't see it this way. We have a different view. We're not concerned about this. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of room to discuss and, and whatnot. Okay. So you mentioned earlier um, the, the, the the cuts, particularly 500,000 barrels, um, maybe as many as a, a million barrels. Um, OPEC, as you, as you can tell better than anyone you know they have these meetings they set up the timetables let's just kind of break this down let's say that um, the saudis do drop five hundred thousand barrels in december which is just you know what 18 19 days away um and then we do see a million million barrels out are we back in a situation where that will go to june barring another special meeting or is there a different schedule for 2019 so the way that I believe it's supposed to work, so they're meeting um, at the beginning of December, December 5th, the joint ministerial meeting, which is what, what just happened, is going to meet again in Vienna. And then uh, this December 6th is the OPEC meeting. December 7th is the like joint one. Then I believe they have a meeting scheduled in March in Baku. Hmm. which is in Azerbaijan, for their, like, grand OPEC plus group. And that could be interesting because it is kind of, like, midway between the two OPEC meetings. And um, and so there could be some interesting things uh, discussed there. Now, they can always have their, you know, like, emergency meetings and whatnot. Sure. But in general... Um, you know, they've talked, there are a bunch of things that they've talked about, like um, they want to like develop new metrics or they may go back to the, you know, each country has its own uh, quotas that they have to adhere to. And um, if that's true, then we may see, more, you know, the, the meetings be, take on much more significance, you know, whereas, you know, reporting exactly how much each country is or is not producing. Um, Saudi Arabia could cut 500,000 barrels a day from its exports and still produce that amount and just send it to storage. I mean, they've been mm -hmm. they have been exporting from stored oil for quite some time now. 
So yeah, that's, they an, could, that's an important distinction. So we're, so we're talking about exports, not necessarily production. So they yeah. could. It, so it, it does take them off the market in a sense, but it's not the same as saying that they're going to, you know, take rigs offline or whatever. Yeah, exactly. And so we could see them either just use this period of lower exports to rebuild their store, their you know oil storage, which has you know been somewhat depleted, or they could send it to their petrochemical plants. I mean, there are all sorts of things they could do. It, this is really all Folly's way, as he was saying. Saying, look, we are seeing less demand. This is how much less we're seeing it. Um, you know, maybe OPEC will want to match this or something like that. But um, you know, he's. I, it was the headlines were kind of uh, a little bit off. I think when they were reporting this. And we talk about big numbers. We talk about oil and gas, but a million barrels. You know that that is. I mean that. That does add up. Yeah, that that adds up pretty quick. I mean, you know, not being facetious, but it's thirty million to thirty-one million barrels a month. I mean, it, it's that's a lot when you talk about, um, you know, how that fits into the global play. So they they could take it off from an export standpoint, which is interesting because the, 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 essentially what you're potentially theorizing is that they could take off these five hundred thousand barrels, um, but then if the prices shoots up too quick, they're in a position to boom, just turn it right back on. So it's not as yeah. if they're cutting down production, which is a big distinction because if they're cutting down production, you've got ramp up time, pipelines, all that kind of stuff. Um, in, this, in this scenario, though, if you're just cutting out exports, um, you can play with the market a little bit there. Uh, you can be a little bit more reactive to it. Yeah, they'll build themselves a nice little supply cushion. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So. Okay, so we got one more story from Reuters. Oman oil minister says majority of OPEC and its allies support cut. Oman's not always a name you hear when you think of <laughs> large oil producing nations, but <laughs> I guess they have a seat at the table. So what's going on here? Yeah. So Oman is in a really interesting position right now. Um, it's not a member of OPEC, but it is kind of one of these up and coming oil producers, and they are part of this OPEC plus community. Right. But what's more interesting than Iran's oil production, oh, sorry, Oman's oil production, is that they've kind of taken a front seat in the like Israel uh, Arab negotiations. And uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu went to visit Oman um, a couple weeks ago, or maybe like two or three weeks ago, two weeks ago. And Oman apparently didn't tell any of the other Arab countries that they were doing this. And it kind of caused a bit of a stir. So I think Oman is also uh, kind of feeling it's uh, it's sitting at the big boys table now. And so the Omani minister uh, and I've always seen him, you know, interested in talking to reporters and and so on and so forth. So what he says is not necessarily reflective of uh, everyone else's reasoning, but it's interesting that I, I think it shows Oman is really looking to take on a larger role in their world. OK, we got Dr. Foreman coming on in just a second. So quick. If you can break this down, Oman, Yemen, Saudi Arabia, they're all right there together. Obviously, Uh, the Saudis and Yemen have some political tension, to put it mildly. What? Uh, (laughs) How much is Saudis working with Oman, or is that at all tied up with what's going on here? Well, I think Oman definitely sees value in cultivating its relationship with Saudi Arabia, but it's always kind of forged its own path. The Sultan of Oman is an interesting character, and uh, they've always kind of been their own independent uh, place. But they've definitely been doing a lot to build up their economy. I know they've really been promoting tourism uh, in Oman. And so uh, I'm not surprised. I don't think they'll ever try to challenge the Saudis. But I do think that they, and this is part of them wanting to be seen as uh, a more developed nation, a destination spot, and uh, someone with leadership potential. Up next, once again, we have on Dr. Foreman from the American Petroleum Institute. Dr. Foreman, it's been about a month, so it's good to have you back on. How's it going, sir? Going great. Thanks again. I always enjoy talking with you all. Good deal. Okay, so you have been kind enough to send us y'all's monthly statistical report. Um, This is volume 42, number 10, which will come out on November 16th. Uh, Kind of break down what some of the findings were, some of the highlights for the listeners. Glad to. So, you know, these reports always have the best monthly information on what's happening in U.S. oil markets. And what we see is we have some good news again, some records for October. For the month of October, it's really the highest U.S. gasoline demand ever at 9.5 million barrels per day. In the petrochemical and refining sector, these the liquid feedstocks that go in, that's just been killing it. That's 5.1 million barrels per day, so a new record. 
And in terms of the way refineries are performing, what the U.S. is actually producing, 16, 6, excuse me, 16.6 .6 million barrels per day for the month of October, which for the month is, is an absolute record. So coupled with that, um, it, they're not brand new records, but our, our crude oil production, our natural gas liquids production are also hitting on all cylinders. The U.S. has had really good news this month. That sounds really, uh, really exciting. But I, I had some questions about that because everywhere else, we are hearing this narrative of the global economy is slowing down. Global oil demand is about to start, uh, you know, is going to be uh, increasing at much lower levels. And um, but then we look at these reports on the U.S. economy and everything is saying like all cylinders are rolling. Everything is going uh, full steam ahead. Can you maybe provide a little bit of, of insight on whether you think that um, the U.S. economy is an anomaly? Is this an exception to the global economy? Is October just an anomaly? Or uh, are the reports not quite as dire as we've been led to believe? It's a fantastic question, Ellen, because it really is the question of the day. When we looked last month at, at the September data, we did see some softness in the demand side and some of the markets reacting you know, with a lag to some of that. When we're looking at now the newest things for October, what we're seeing is a, a bit of a rebound. We've seen the rebound in exports. We've seen the rebound in demand. And this isn't to say that all the economic news is just going to continue to hit on all, all cylinders. I think if, if we're frank about it, we've accelerated so much activity into the second and third quarters of this year. And on a year-over-year -year basis, if you look at U.S. GDP growth in the third quarter, it's only just reached the administration's target of 3%. So there is a good chance that the consensus is correct that growth flows from here in the U.S. and globally. And we know China's in triage mode. We know European growth, the economic growth came in below expectations for the third quarter. So all of that is tangible. And in terms of what's happening on the global oil market side, you're now seeing a situation where the EIA has shifted its signals to say, hey, it looks like the global market's now in a surplus. So I think it all jibes, but altogether, the U.S. has the, the relatively brightest story among them. So when it comes to gasoline demand, I'm, I'm interested in, in unpacking some of these numbers a little bit more because we've seen falling gasoline prices across the nation. And uh, it does seem like we uh, like the data indicate that we're going to continue to see this. But uh, do you think that these numbers will continue through uh, through November, through December? Or could if we see uh, perhaps if OPEC changes its tune, could we start to see some increases in um, U.S. gasoline prices? Or are, are we in such a great surplus that that could be pushed off for some time? You know, it's. The timing between oil prices and gas prices, you know, oil is the top factor that goes into making it, and it, the prices definitely correlate over time, but it's hard to micrometer it to the week or month in the sense that there can be timing differences in what's delivered. Now, if we take the last couple of months where up until the last few weeks oil prices have actually gone up, the remarkable thing with gasoline prices was, according to AAA data, that basically they were a nationwide average that was steady just over $2.90 per gallon for four consecutive months. So it, it's interesting how resilient or how steady that's been through the variation that we've seen that's been relatively large, where oil prices went up, and then now in the last couple of weeks, they've come down more than 10%. So it, we can't really predict as API where these things go, but because these production numbers are so so strong, regardless of what happens really on the international arena, U.S. consumers continue to be cushioned. We see these domestic oil prices that are still, this last month, upwards of $10 per barrel below international prices. So th these, this cushion or shocking silver for the U.S. consumer has continued to be in place, and that should help support economic activity at a level. Hmm. I hope that uh, the president's listening to our podcast because he seemed rather concerned about the possibility of um, OPEC creating some sort of jump in oil prices, whereas you're saying that, well, you know, even if they do, U.S. has still got got plenty of cushion and, um, you know, we don't have to we don't have to get alarmed 
uh, at this point. Maybe you could talk a little bit about the jet fuel numbers, which were also really interesting because uh, last time you talked about how uh, jet fuel demand is really a good indicator of, of the economy. And maybe you could talk a little bit about what you're seeing in October and perhaps what we could look for in November, which is obviously a big travel month. Sure, glad to. So in October, we saw kerosene jet fuel deliveries of 1.7 million barrels per day. So that's about 3.7% above where it was in August. And it, it, that's, that's still solid demand growth in terms of what we're seeing and the seasonality pattern that's gone with it. Uh, and the indications from um, organizations that follow global travel and the revenue passenger kilometers have basically said, look, it, it's not – it's not burning up the trail right now, but it's doing very solidly in the sense that year to year things are still up on a relatively strong basis. Now, it, you're right, this is probably the, the best coincident indicator of how the economy is ab absolutely doing. And both on a domestic and a global scale, we're seeing a lot of air travel. We're also continuing to see a fair amount of air freight uh, as a result of Amazon and, uh, and other shipping of goods. So it's a good sign in terms of consumption, consumer confidence. While it's come off of some of the highs recently, it's still high. So people still feel relatively wealthy and they're traveling. Um, the, the thing that we would maybe be concerned about in the next few months is this financial market volatility as it plays out tends in the U.S. to have an impact on the real economy of how people feel in terms of their wealth and their, their consumption behavior that can affect businesses. So watch this space. But up to this point, the numbers have been relatively strong. Okay, so um, I remember during the old, old glut a few years ago, there was a lot of talk about refineries and working through shutdown season and you know the impact on if refineries had to go off longer, the impact that that, that, that could have on prices. We don't hear a lot of that talk right now, but I noticed in the report you talked about refineries are working at their, their highest rate, and they really seem to be very efficient. There's a lot of um, products that are being refined. H how crucial is it right now, or is it – as crucial as it used to be that the refineries keep working at this this high level that, that, that they are working at right now? So if, if the refineries weren't working at these at close to record levels in terms of refinery throughput, on a year-to-date basis and for October, it, it's definitely the highest throughput that we've seen from a U.S. refining basis. It, as long as demand remains solid, you really need that to have that domestic supply. Otherwise, you have to start turning to imports of gasoline and diesel fuel and jet fuel to, to meet that demand. And it, it's just a lot more efficient in terms of the supply chain, and it keeps prices lower to have all of this integration happening here at home. And frankly, it adds a lot more jobs and economic value in the process when we do that. So, look, it, it's a good news story in the sense that we have fewer and fewer absolute numbers of refiners, but the capacity has continued to grow in the U.S. The throughput has continued to incrementally grow. And this year, we've seen this reliability that the outages has been, have been at record lows at times. So it, it is good in terms of the performance, the safety, the operability, and all of that is helping consumers at the end of the day. Yeah, and this may be a little bit outside of what you guys study, but I am curious, is there – is there a reason? Do we know is it disadvantaged technology, uh, maintenance practices? How is it these refineries are able to run at such high capacity for such long periods of time without any major outages? Well, I think part of it is, is the investments that have been made and the continued improvements in the technology and the monitoring to make sure that they understand what turnarounds have to be done. Those are being done. And as that happens, though, they, they've got a really good sense of what's necessary. And they, with the investments that have been made in recent years with this, uh, you know, frankly, a few years now where we've seen uh, a good turn for U.S. oil markets, this has been a renaissance and nothing short of it in terms of U.S. natural gas and oil industry as well as the things downstream from it. So with those investments made and continued expansions in refining capacity, the availability of the different crudes, th this is a system that's worked very effectively with high integrity now. So are you at all concerned about the fact that we really have essentially not built any new refineries in the United States since the 1970s? Or do you see it as, you know what, it's tough to build refineries and at least we're keeping up our old ones or expanding them? 
You know, it's not the number. It's the size and the quality of them and what they can produce. So when you know, we chart this kind of thing, and when I looked at it last year, I think the, the number for the U.S. was 141 refineries. And then in the EIA's latest reporting, it was down to 135 this last year. So you know, six, six of them shuttered their doors. But yet the capacity and the throughput has continued to go up because these are relatively smaller things that are closing. And you're seeing investments in expanding at existing facilities that have increased this throughput. So as long as that continues, and frankly, you're getting world-class refineries with the ability to supply domestic markets, to have export infrastructure, to work off of a wider crude slate as the U.S. is continuing to produce more and more light oil. It can take the Canadian heavy oil, the Venezuelan heavy oil, the light oil from the U.S., if that continues to grow and take better advantage of what we have domestically, it's a win in that sense. So I, I think it's it's not so much about the numbers, but really focusing on the quality and, and the volume of what it's been able to produce. Do you, do you see any um, positive changes or do you see any more uh, perhaps changes uh, to the U.S. overall refining capacity that would enable the U.S. to actually utilize more of the light crude oil that is being produced? Is there any movement along those lines? Definitely, yes. There's been investments continued in distillation capacity and expansion of that. That's where you're seeing the most growth as opposed to uh, so-called conversion capacity or um, you know, the, the ability to take heavier oils and upgrade them into lighter products. So companies want, especially if they're locationally advantaged to where the oil is being produced, they want to be able to take maximum advantage of that and to get it to market as quickly as possible. And we've seen even on not just the, the smaller refineries that are maybe closest to the shale patch, but like in, in Baytown, Texas, what ExxonMobil is doing with its big commitment to $50 billion worth of investment in the U.S., you know, a big part of that is refinery upgrades and continuing to expand that capacity. So as that happens with state-of-the-art technology, that, that's where you'll see continued growth and investment. And um, uh, one, one other um, kind of thought along along these lines, um, do you uh, have any, any thoughts about uh, what's been going on lately with the Keystone XL pipeline? Um, it seems, of course, every other month, the Keystone XL pipeline seems to get in the news again, even though it doesn't even exist yet. Um, and uh, and any thoughts on on its future prospects for maybe becoming a reality? Uh, I, I think there's been a, an industry commitment and a political commitment by this administration to try to move the ball forward with it. And for every step forward, there's been a step back. And it, with latest legal maneuvering, it seems like that there are more hurdles that are going to have to be met in terms of environmental impact statements and making sure that it's demonstrated that it, it has a minimum impact and is doing things to the best possible way. Um, it, hopefully these aren't things that kill the prospects for it because there is complementarity, especially between the Canadian and U.S. Uh, supply chains for refining and production. So as this goes forward, it it supplies something the U.S. market definitely needs in terms of producing a, a wide variety of products out of its refining structure. So as an industry, we, we see a need for it. We hope it goes forward. Uh, but we're going to have to continue to fight the good fight and make sure that uh, the envir environmental questions are answered to a high quality along the way. Okay. Um, one more question for me, at least, and then we'll let you get out of here. Um, you, you, one of the last things you cover in your report is inventories, and you say that the, this was the largest accumulation since March 2015, uh, monthly accumulation, that is, since March 2015. That kind of – March 2015 wasn't a good month. <laughs> so when I hear that, it, it kind of kind of scares me a little bit. Should I be scared, or is it just, hey, you know what, it's just – this is just kind of how it hit. It's nothing to be alarmed alarmed with here. Well, let's keep it in context with we're just looking at crude stocks, not total. So you know, a lot of your stocks are, are refined products as well. Right. But in terms of U.S. crude oil, what this is saying is that as you're looking, you think of it this way, you've got really high refining throughput. So the refiners are taking a lot and processing a lot, but yet the production is so strong that you've seen one of the largest increases in you know, basically more than three years of the accumulation of crude stocks. So the first quarter of 2015, in terms of the amount of crude that accumulated, 
I, I hear you from a price standpoint, maybe not the best time, but you did see the stock start to accumulate relatively rapidly, and here we are in that period, uh, maybe not pretending the same kind of, of economic consequences, but definitely looking at an accumulation of crude in a way that uh, should continue to cushion the market. So when we look at the broader global supply-demand balance, how much supply is deemed necessary, and the statements that are coming from various parties about you know, should Saudi produce more or less? Does Russia produce more or less? What does OPEC want to do? All of these actually are looking back over their shoulder to this U.S. crude stock number and saying that's a bead on how the U.S. market's doing. And given that the economy has been relatively strong, the demand's been relatively solid, this continues to say that hmm, you know, the U.S. has supplied virtually all global demand growth so far this year, and it looks like it's continuing to do that. So we've got a really good market share fight on our hands you know, between the U.S., and global players, and it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out in the coming months. Okay, Ellen, unless there's anything else, we're going to let the good Dr. Foreman go. Um, no, H I like that. Go ahead. I like ending on that note. Okay. okay. API.org is where you can find this report. We were recording on Monday. This report will be out on Thursday, November 16th. You can go to the API's website on the top right-hand corner. It has a spot right there where you click on Chief Economist for the API, and you can download this report. I'm sure there's a newsletter you can sign up for as well that you can get to us. Dr. Foreman, we love you having you on. Thank you for sending this report. Anything else that people need to be aware of before we let you get out of here today? I think that's all, Ryan Allen. Thanks so much again for a great conversation, and I, I love doing this. Thank you. Thanks for coming on. Thanks again to Dr. Foreman for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. Now, he was on the road traveling, took some time out for us, so thank you for that. Ellen, any takeaways from Dr. Foreman's report? Yeah, I think that the point about uh, U.S. refineries uh, becoming uh, a lot more uh, acceptable or accepting a lot more uh, light crude oil is something that we really need to keep in mind because this is a story we've been talking about you know, for years. And finally, we're seeing U.S. refineries being able to accept more light oil. And that could really change uh, the picture when people talk about oversupply of light crude. And uh, that and, and basically the, the uh, economic outlook, it's um, – I think it paints a really interesting contrast and mm -hmm. uh, between the U.S. and uh, possibly what's going on in Europe and Asia. Yeah, and I was, you know, uh, it's funny those refineries when when the when the old glut was here, the refineries seemed to be the talk. You know, they can't shut down, they can't shut down. We've kind of forgot yeah. that, and they're they're running great now. But it's kind of one of those things you you kind of sit back and you go, huh? They're running optimal. Boy, if one of them were to come offline, what would that do to the market? And you know how prices would react? It's just something that seems yeah. like there, there's so many things you can talk about in the oil and gas market that this seems like one story that's just kind of gotten put into the back burner, and, and rightfully so. They seem to be doing great. But it's just interesting just to read how efficient those things are running and they you don't hear of any problems really i mean obviously you got a hurricane and stuff like that that can you know but talk about natural problems with them uh, having um, long blackouts it just it just doesn't happen anymore yeah i remember and and you'd hear like a long blackout and suddenly you'd see like gas prices shoot up in chicago and mm -hmm. you know we really haven't seen that for a while it's almost like you didn't realize that we hadn't been seeing it until now yep okay all right dr energy anywhere you will be this week that people can find you or should so um, I'm going to be on uh, Marketplace later today. I guess uh, maybe people have missed that, but I'll tweet out the link uh, on NPR's Marketplace uh, talking about Saudi Arabia and Russia and oil. And then uh, look for me on investing.com on Thursday. No Forbes? Uh, maybe. maybe. I've, I've, I, I overdid it a little with the election coverage, so um, I'm, I'm letting that uh, you know, offshore drilling and e-cigarettes piece sink for a little while. Oh, and we, we need to update the listeners. That did pass, by the way. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that passed. Oh, yeah, there's no offshore drilling and no e-cigs in the workplace in Florida. So. By the way, as I discovered, that's not all offshore drilling. That's just offshore drilling on state waters. Oh, okay. It doesn't apply to federal land. Okay. And I didn't want to cut off Dr. Foreman's time here, but real quick, I did see an article from the Wall Street Journal last week that said that there was three factors in the judge's decision. I have not read the judge's decision on the Keystone, but environmental um, carbon emissions was one, um, spills was the other, but the economic viability of the project <gasps> with low oil price was one of them, and I thought... <gasps> It, oh no, 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 that God. was that was according to the Wall Street Journal. I have not sourced that myself. It's just what it said. I thought if that's true, 
how is that any of your business? If they want to lose a bunch of money, let them lose a bunch of money. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Who, who is that? Also, who is this judge to be saying that low oil prices are here to stay? Like, yeah, does he have know. some sort of? Uh, that makes me think that maybe he's invested in. You know, he's like invested in. You know, solar or something like that. Yeah, or or he's a he or she. I don't know what it was. I don't know if it's a man or male or female, but there, there's a moron is what I would say. If you, if you're, I mean, uh, you're, you're, you're honored. You're welcome on the show, but you will be called a moron. I'm just going to say, if that's true, that's according to sources. So I'm not. See, like, I go with the devious, like, I think he's, uh, you know, economic interest. And you're like, nah, I think he's just stupid. <laughs> I'm not really sure which would be more. I mean, you, you don't think that, okay, a judge actually probably, like, why would he have knowledge of global oil markets? Like, he should be an expert in the law, right. not global oil markets. Well, it, so it, I hope you're right. But I mean, even if, even if, even if that that is true, so let's assume it is true that, that that that's part of it. Who who in the world can answer that question? Like, you know, how, how who are you going to bring in? You know, um, Bloomberg uh, bring in City. Uh, it's going to say it's going to hit a hundred, and then you know, oh, Bill God. McKibben says it's going to hit twenty. I mean, what? Ask I mean, Gartman, why not? You know. <laughs> Oh, Dr. Energy and myself would be happy to testify on this, but um, just be prepared, yeah, Your Honor. It, it won't go well. So anyways, I, I didn't want to cut off Dr. Foreman's time, but there was an article from the Wall Street Journal. I think it's the Wall Street Journal last week that said that. I, I just shook my head. The economic viability of the project with oil, low oil prices. Like, ha, give me a break. Give me a break. So anyways, all right, Dr. Energy. <sighs> You know, I'll let you go with this. Um, we were hoping for a good Celtic seasons, but it's starting off rough for us. So we, we... You know, they got to go to the basket. They've got to <laughs> stop letting themselves go down by like 30 points before halftime. Because even when you come back, like why? All right, enough Celtics. I'm not going to coach from, from podcast. I'm not an expert in basketball, but I do think you have to score more points than the other team. I think that is a yes. prerequisite to winning. So I agree. <laughs> you have to actually shoot the ball into the basket to do that. Okay. All right. For the one and only Dr. Energy Ellen Walker herself, this is Ryan Race, and we'll talk to you next week. Bye. Bye.